All right, great, guys. Before we start talking about stuff today, um, I wanted to just throw out a couple things in case I run out of time. I want to make sure you guys see this. Um, the first is we'll talk a little bit about some of the robots that we use to figure out what's going on on the planet right now. Um, and I hope you guys, uh, so right now most people that fly my robots get jobs and go away and, and uh, do cool stuff up in Silicon Valley and other places around the world. Um, and right now we're, we have a bunch of projects that are just about to start and all my, most of my expert pilots have left. We have a class right now that teaches you guys introduction to to called um, Fundamentals of Remotely Piloted Systems. If anybody's interested, it's a pretty fun class. You can still join if you guys wanted to come this week. You guys are probably busy, but um, this is the main way that we train people that start getting into our, um, our lab that fly things around and swim things around the planet. So if that's of even vague interest, I, I would encourage you guys to come this Friday. We meet uh, only on Fridays. Um, it's uh, ESRM 370. And uh, again, no prereqs, you guys are welcome to come. If you guys are interested, please come. And we meet in the second floor of Sierra Hall in our, in our tech lab. So if it's a, even vaguely interesting, you guys come by, do that. <coughs> Number next, uh, next week on the 15th, we're having a colleague come from a consortium that we created of all the CSUs for people that do work in the ocean and coastal zone. And we have 18 paid internships this summer across the state of California for folks. A whole range of different types of types of stuff. Um, you can apply online. You don't need to come. But Dr. Krista Kamer, who's the head of that uh, our program, our Coast program, is going to be here on campus, and she's going to give you guys free pizza. So it's free lunch next uh, from February 15th next week. Um, sign up though ahead of time just so they know how much pizza to order. And it's just going to be an info session to give you some background on some of the internship applications. Open to anybody on campus, all majors, any any background, etc. If you can't make that, she's going to be in my lab at 9 o'clock on that same day if you guys want to talk with her. So uh, think about taking our ESRM 370. Think about um, uh, uh, coming and, and seeing if you might be able to get a cool job this summer. And then thirdly, Dr. O'Hara might have already shared this with you, but um, every spring we do a seminar series. Um, and this year, the very first one is starting this Thursday, so tomorrow. Um, these are free open to everybody. They uh, are ESRM themed, but you don't have to be an ESRM major. Uh, they're, they're targeted at sort of entry level, you guys, freshman level folks. So, so um, they're understandable by everyone. And I think it really will um, give you guys additional sense of the kind of things that we do in ESRM. So first one's coming up this uh, Thursday. And they go all along, include everyone from an econ economic type stuff to, to people that figure out how sand moves around, a whole range of, of topics. In this case, this semester, focusing on um, what's going on with our beaches. And I'll give you an hour of service learning um, when you go to these. If you go to all, you have the six hours, and you don't get six hours of service learning. You get a maximum of two hours of service learning. So if you go to two, you get two hours. You go to six, you get two hours. Okay. I encourage you to go on Thursday. Yeah, and, and the time says 6 to 7.30, it doesn't go that long. The talks usually go 6 to 6.45, 6.50. The rest is just question time. So if you guys had something to do at 7, you could come for the first hour and get free cookies and stuff. And, uh, and you don't have to be there for the full hour and a half unless you wanted to talk to our presenter and all that great stuff. So come check it out. All right, let's get back to what we're talking about today. So I'm going to give you guys, my goal today is to give you guys a sense of what we do in ESRM. Uh, <coughs> Are there any ESRM majors in here? A few? OK, cool. So um, I would encourage you guys to think about uh, doing an ESRM major or a minor. We are the most interdisciplinary um, group on campus with the except major, with the exception of uh, liberal studies, which I don't think exactly counts, because liberal studies you can pretty much take anything, um, by and large. Uh, after them, we're incredibly interdisciplinary. So when I revised the curriculum when I came several years ago, we uh, dropped down to 72% of the classes to get your ESRM degree or outside of ESRM. And so, so even now, um, the vast majority, we make sure you guys take economics, biology, chemistry, political science, literature, the environment, all this stuff, because we think this interdisciplinary thinking is absolutely essential to solving a lot of the challenges you guys are learning about this semester. 
Um, and so because of that, because of the very interdisciplinary nature, it's a really, really, um, comparatively speaking, easy fit if you guys have another major, either to double major or to minor. Um, because we, we um, you can count so many of the classes that you're already taking for your other degree. Most majors aren't like that. Most majors are you take all these classes in this department and you take all those classes in that department. Uh, we're different. So also, I'll be rambling on today. So if I say something that's not clear, interrupt me. If I say something that's, that I if I slur some word or say something, please by all means stop me and ask me what's going on. The basic thing that I want to convey to you guys is that um, in some academic disciplines, people draw pretty clear lines between the different types of activities that we as professors, that you guys as students do. We do not in ESRM. It, it's a very blurry line and there's a ton of feedback from one component to another component to another component. The typical breakdown, people will talk about research and historically that's been considered different than what we're doing here in this room, teaching and learning which is considered different from service when we give back to our community, either our academic community or the wider community um, outside the university. We don't see that at all. And, and we really um, uh, see this as a, a big flowing river that sloshes here and sloshes there. So to illustrate that, a couple examples to start us off um, is first and foremost, we really do in ESRM believe in all these university pillars you guys have heard about service learning, multicultural, international, all that stuff. We actually really believe in that. And so a few examples of that. So all the dark red are places where I currently right now have active research. Uh, almost everywhere involves our undergrads. The only place is Eastern Turkey because things blow up and um, the provost doesn't like me to take students to tag pairs and stuff. But, um, but other than that, uh, all, the, all the solid red are some of our active projects. Talk about some of those in a few minutes. But then also we have some projects like our seafood supply studies. Um, we're in the middle of writing a paper on the totality of oil spills across the planet, um, et cetera, that really aren't any place-based. They're really about applied to the whole planet. Um, and then uh, as examples, the sort of light, the sort of darker colors like Antarctic Peninsula and stuff are places where I uh, used to work. I don't actively work there now. This is just me. We have tons of faculty in ESRM, and all of us have experience in different parts of the world. So we truly do um, uh, believe in international perspectives and try as much as possible to get you guys uh, involved. Um, service learning is very big, as, as you're learning in 100 here, having uh, service hours. Um, we also try to fold that in as much as possible in our other classes outside of ESRM 100 as well. This is a class I teach every spring. This is the the 10th annual run of it, this, just now this semester. This is a class I take students to Louisiana. We spend about half the time doing wetland restoration. The other half the time, we used to rebuild homes. Now we install food gardens in poor neighborhoods. The whole purpose of the class is to understand why Hurricane Katrina and now the Deepwater Horizon happened, why they happened in that place, why things haven't been fixed, so the political systems, the ecological systems, the social systems, social justice, all this stuff is wrapped up in this story. Um, as we, we do, for example, the history of Louisiana through food. So we take a six hour cooking class, class with a chef friend of ours. We meet with Pulitzer Prize winners. We meet with uh, different uh, jazz and blues and Zydeco musician friends of ours. We go hear them perform. And it's really about um, helping out our friends, making new friends, it's not a traditional class, but it's absolutely service uh, learning and service focused. Um, I would hope you guys would be interested in taking this class. Again, it's open to everybody across uh, campus. It's, not, it's an ESRM class, but it's not, it's not, uh, you don't have to be an ESRM major. Um, if, you, if this isn't of interest to you, I want all of you to take an IRA sponsored trip before you graduate. Right now, every single one of you is paying for this. You guys all pay a $50 fee, instructionally related activity fee. That goes for when we bring dancers on campus or a speaker, that kind of stuff, which is great. They also fund our abroad and away experiences. And so this trip is one of those. It's been, we've been lucky enough to be funded by the IRA for the last decade. The general rule of thumb with these trips, you guys pay one third, school pays two thirds. You still have to pay, I know that can be tough, 
But um, for what you get, it's incredibly cheap. So we go for not quite two weeks to Louisiana, and it costs our students about 650 bucks. School pays the rest. That, that's airfare, that's your food, that's all that kind of jazz. Uh, we, just fin we just wrapped up a trip to the Cook Islands this summer where we took a class um, there. So, so check them out. You guys can uh, uh, search these. There's, there's ones that go over winter break, there's ones that go over spring break, and there's ones that go over summer. And whatever your interest is, even if it's not ESRM, there's something for you guys. There's an English class or an art class or whatever. So please do um, take advantage of that and don't, don't uh, not consider applying for an IRA trip. Uh, the other thing, other example of how our service and research and everything flubs together. This is um, a project that we started. Uh, the ESRM faculty began working on beaches a few years ago. Um, and we have a sort of a, a, a big collaboration where all of the faculty and a bunch of our students work on this. Um, we started getting interested in a new aspect of um, looking at the health of beaches, which was, hey, do, are we seeing little teeny tiny pieces of plastic? And long story short, one of our students said, hey, we started finding a bunch of little teeny plastic in and around. Is, is Dorothy, are they coming to talk? Oh, she's here to talk to you guys. Oh, you are another story. I can skip it. Perfect. So, uh, so this was a research project that now became a student research project that now is, uh, we just had um, some, some Congress people tour our, tour our lab uh, last week. We, um, these guys have gone and presented their work to industry, Patagonia and clothing manufacturers. And now we're actually spinning up a new class just called The Beach so that um, we can talk about these issues. So this notion of service and research and teaching it all flubs together. I think this is a great example. Um, the other thing to say is that we really try to be um, cutting edge isn't right. We, we bleed a lot because we tried all, we try a lot of new things. Not, not because we want the newest of the new, but because we're always trying to get new perspectives on environmental challenges. And we think that a lot of the new technologies that are rolling down and new approaches to thinking about these problems uh, can be really helpful. And so one quick example of that is this. This is a consortium we're in the middle of spinning up. Uh, it's called Corsairs. And this is a, a public-private partnership with CSUCI and industry and the government and, wh and whoever else wants to partner. Um, centered around our increasing use of robotics to, to monitor and assess the condition of our coastal environments. So this picture is taken on a dock outside our hotel in the Cook Islands by my, my students uh, a few months ago in our, in our uh, first ever class to the Cook Islands. And so what you're seeing there is a fixed wing aircraft that our students built that um, the same exact thing that the government owns cost $200,000. We built that for $1,500, right? And it works just about as good. Um, on the upper left is a little robot that swims underwater. That again, it's just, just cost after we were done with it, maybe a couple thousand bucks. On the right is a commercial grade um, a drone, a commercial grade uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. All these things we use to map, in this case, map the coral reefs and map the islands of this particular location in the South Pacific. Uh, and to create maps and help the government understand how uh, water is coming off the hillsides and, and pollution issues and the health of the reef. So that kind of stuff is going on. Um, uh, a challenge, as you guys, you guys might know, there are issues with, with things flying around. Um, we, as ESRM, are interested in the interdisciplinary uh, aspect of this stuff. So we don't just teach folks to fly. That's my class. I'd love for you guys to come and to our Friday class, and we'll teach you guys how to do this kind of stuff. But um, that's an important part, safely operate this stuff. You don't want to be some Yahoo flying over the 101 and, or flying the White House or some idiot like that, right? But, um, but we're interested in this technology broadly writ. And we realize that if we're not part of the conversation, the conversation will all become about TMZ trying to see Brad Pitt's naked butt in his house, right, spying, or everybody worried about the police shooting people and stuff with these things. Those, those are real concerns. But that's the entirety of the conversation. There's a huge space for responsible management of the coast that can save us tons and tons of money. We're building a laser measure or thing that will slap on the butt of one of these things that when we're done will cost maybe $10,000. Dr. O'Heirich's recent NSF grant to map a small watershed once, hiring the traditional method of using an airplane with one of these laser things, that was like $30,000 for one flight. It took like, what, six months to get the data back? 
Yeah, right? This technique will allow us to go out there and do it repeatedly all day long. We don't have to wait for the, the uh, you know, fog to clear. We don't have to wait for some pilot to fly in from another state to do whatever. We'll have control, massively reducing the cost and therefore radically increasing the utility for us and for managers to do a better job managing fires and erosion and all that kind of stuff. So, so we're interested in that for all these reasons, but it's clear that worry about police stuff or privacy, whatever, is dominating the conversation. And so, for example, we do public opinion polling. This is from a, uh, my, my coastal and marine class. And so, in this case, this was uh, uh, not quite 1,300 people we interviewed face-to-face -face on a whole variety of questions. Um, and the question was, hey, what do you think about little small robots flying in the air? Is that good, bad? You freaked out? What's the deal? And so, um, if you add up all the negative views and add up all the positive views right here, you see that the negative views outweigh the positive about two to one. So people do have a view, they're more likely to have a negative view of this technology. But, period, new paragraph, if you look at all the folks that are neutral or undecided, that's two thirds of the population. So we find this a lot with a lot of our ESRM issues, a lot of these sort of politically divisive things. If you read the newspaper stories, you think, oh, blah, 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 I hate it, oh, blah, 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 I love it, right? And it sounds like that's what the debate is. In reality, it's usually much more complicated than that. So what this is telling us is if we can do a good job in the next few years of showing the power of this technology and being responsible users of this, not looking at naked people on the beach and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, we can actually uh, have support for this. And we don't have to worry about constantly getting permission for all these issues, right? So, so that's the kind of stuff that we bring as ESRM that most folks uh, don't. I just came back from an educator conference this last weekend with folks from all around the country, and as far as I can tell, we're the only university thinking about this kind of stuff. A lot of people are interested, but they're interested in flying the thing around. They're not really interested in the whole context of the technology, as we are. We also confront issues directly. When we first started getting our drones, uh, <laughs> How do I say this without swearing? The um, uh, certain risk management folks thought that's dangerous, so we shouldn't do it. So we had to create our own policy that said if we accidentally fly over somebody that's naked, <coughs> or we fly over some private property we're not supposed to be, we'll delete that data immediately, um, and all these other things, safe flying and all this and that. So we created this. It took about two years. I thought we were the country bumpkins that everybody else in the world is using this, and we're just sort of out here in the backwater somewhere. Turns out no one else was really thinking about this. So now our policy that we developed here is being emulated at all these other schools around the, the Western US. So, so we went from thinking that we were at the back end of the line to actually we're one of the folks in the, in the forefront of that. And again, you guys can take that class. As one small example of the kind of stuff that we can do, so this is one 15 minute drone flight over a, a coastal cliff uh, here. And we use a software called Pix4D. We've gotten very good at it. We got it so good that my head lab tech just got hired away to go to work for Silicon Valley and make a, more money than I could pay him. Uh, and, and so um, this is super cool. This is, this is sort of game changing. So this 3D model, right, we can spin, we can look at it, we can do all kinds of cool stuff, we can zoom on in. So we can do a quick flight and fly over, say, a bird colony and get in, get out, and then post-process, count the number of birds. We don't have to sit there and hover and disturb the mom when she has the chick, or, or whatever the case may be. We can fly this, and we can measure how quickly the cliff is eroding. Um, all within our power. It's, it's crazy how much power we have with this kind of stuff. We're brand new, we're the babies. We're the newest Cal State, right? You guys all know that. And because we're the baby, we don't have all this other stuff built up. Many of our sister campuses do great things, but they're, they have the this policy and the that policy and the da 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 da. And so they, they wouldn't think of doing this because they have all this other stuff they already purchased and we have to use this, we have to use the airplane because we bought the airplane, right? We haven't bought any of that stuff. So we're sort of jump, leapfrogging, jumping ahead of a lot of our colleagues because we don't have anything. So we're getting the newest of the new and this is but one small example of that. Um, this technology is used by our students. In this case, this is one of my students doing his senior capstone. So we have a senior capstone requirement in ESRM. And uh, in this case, he was using some of our underwater 
robots to measure how many fish were inside a park out at, in the Channel Islands versus in the protected area versus outside of the park. Do we see more or less fish? So we can do, we can do cool stuff like that. We can respond quickly to environmental disasters. So when the refugio oil spill happened this past spring, we boom, within, within a couple hours, we're out there monitoring the beaches, all this and that. We're also using our technology to see if we could see, in this case, uh, oil deposited underneath the um, surface of the water. Um, and I'll show you one more video, and then we'll get on to talking what we're going to talk about. So this is, um, this is an example from our Cook Islands work, and this is robotics. I keep talking about robotics because it's all in my head lately. So we'll show this video, and then we'll get on to all the other cool stuff we do. So this is just emphasizing the robotics stuff. We were doing all kinds of other surveys, uh, people surveys, to look at how people, uh, with people's health, doing um, uh, surveys of beaches, surveys of reefs, uh, water quality, all kinds of stuff. This is only about the robotic stuff. But this was CSUCI, pairing with a, a research institution in the UK. They found us, they found our blog, and their robots were breaking. They said, can you guys help us fix our robots? And we said, sure. So over YouTube videos. Right, here we are on the Cook Islands. It's the Maryland Aquatic Robot Research Team along with Plymouth uh, Marine Laboratory from the UK. This is Guy Trimmy, and this is a team member from AR. <laughs> Tragically hip. So this is, an, this is a sand uh, shoal that's been created in the last couple of years. And so this is one of our robots up in the air, spinning around, just looking around the lagoon. It's a pretty, pretty cool place to go chill out. Um, so all this, all this sand area is, is basically brand new. So in a couple decades, this will look like all the other stuff. So we're just doing stuff up in the air, doing stuff underwater. Um, the thing underwater is both counting fish and about coral and stuff like that. Um, this is what it looked like in the airplane when we were flying in. The place is called Aitutaki. It's a pretty tricky place. Um, uh, we're also, and so we find this technology is a great way to meet people because all, the kids love it. Kids always come wherever we go. Kids come up and like, hey, what's that? Um, this is guys being young people, doing young people things. Um, so right, if risk management asks, we don't ride motorcycles, so that wasn't, that wasn't us. Uh, this is us uh, uh, trying to land this one airplane. So we, we fly it automatically, but when we come into land, we try to control it. And this is getting a little bumpy, and he's going to try to uh, land it. And uh, it gets really windy, and he try, he's, this guy's supposed to catch it, and he misses it. So he shoots, oh, he shoots, and he scores a goal. So more, did better than Cam Newton, right? But um, uh, so, so we, this case, this is what the students are learning to do. In uh, this case, this is using a different, another platform. Uh, for us to uh, look at the health of the beach and, and the shape of the beach. And then this is one of our underwater robots. So our colleague from the UK was trying to come up with a new imaging technology to look at, among other things, cancer in people eventually, without using radiation, just using light. And so it, it, we have to find chemicals that when you shine a certain wavelength of light on them, they shine back. And so we built this thing to stick on our robot and so what you're going to see now is this is, on, this is at night, and we're going to turn off the light in a second. And uh, when we hit the right color, when we hit the right substance, it's going to glow. So there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And that stuff that looks blue, that's flying today, that's orange, ignore that. So the stuff that looks sort of bright green, blue, that's our, that's our ranging laser, but um, is this coral that happened like right there. So all that stuff. Um, is potentially of interest, and we've discovered, by the way, that we can use this to actually census not just sort of biomedical stuff, we can use it to census the health of these coral. We think we can now detect coral disease before the coral dies, just by looking at it with this, with this sort of special light. And so um, that thing, let me kill this for it, makes more noise. So that whole collaboration with those folks, I mean, we, we were going to the Cooks, we've been going to the Cooks for several years, but, but this part of it, they reached out to us through our, our social media and our blogging stuff. We, they built some stuff in the UK. We built some stuff here with our, with our stuff that we have in the lab that costs only a few thousands of dollars, not millions and millions of dollars. And we showed up uh, on the other side of the world and the two things fit perfectly together and went and collected data. Really, really cool. So those kind of collaborations are, are really invaluable and are increasingly a part of the stuff we do. Uh, we do all kinds of stuff. Um, but 
leaving the robot stuff aside for a second, I also want to give you guys a sense of what we do in ESRM in some of the upper division classes. Again, our major is really about give, giving you guys the fundamentals and a whole bunch of different fields. And so for the first year or so, you're kind of doing more of the entry level stuff and it's sometimes hard to see what we do. I really don't get you guys typically until you're juniors and seniors because you have so many of the, of the uh, lower division stuff to get, get under your belt. But to give you a sense of what we do in those upper division classes, this is uh, our conservation biology class. These are our students planning, designing a new series of protected area networks and they wear hats. When I teach them, they wear hats because people are like, I said, you're the, you're the fisherman and you're the, you're the oil guy and you're the government guy. And everybody's like, yeah, I'm the government guy, you know. But then when I found, I put hats on them, then they actually start behaving like the government guy or the, or the enviro guy. So it actually works really well. So we do, we use the, the programs we use to simulate how we make protected areas are the same exact things our colleagues use around the world when they're working with local communities and governments to design uh, protected areas. Um, we have a, a big roadkill project that, if we have time, I'll talk about at the end. Uh, these, are, these, these are some of my students. Uh, we do a, a trip up the central coast every year, a three-day trip. This is students doing surveys up in um, San Luis Obispo County, looking at the effect of over-harvesting, in this case of a little uh, mollusk in the inner tidal. Um, we have projects, as I said, around the world. In this case, this is uh, me giving a couple CSUCI t-shirts to the then Mayor of the town where our NGO works out of, this is in eastern Turkey uh, near the Armenian border. So we work from the Iranian border up to the, to the Black Sea um, on, on conservation and sustainable development with Turkish and Kurdish uh, villages. And, um, and so that, that's the mayor. And the guy holding the red shirt is uh, the then um, mayor of the, pro uh, the, the then uh, uh, head of the province um, for the government. Um, we started using technology a while ago. I started using technology a while ago because I would disappear. In this case, I would disappear for a week or so sometimes to Turkey. And so I started recording our, my, my uh, experiences so our students back here could learn from it. And so we do that a lot now. We, we do a lot of podcasting um, that are available to you guys. So if you're curious as to what our classes are like, you guys can go to iTunes, you can go to our YouTube channel, and you can sort of poke around and just listen to a thing for five minutes, ten minutes to get a sense of what our, our upper division classes and research is what, like. Um, this is a, a colleague of mine from University of Zagreb, Dr. Josip Kusak, who um, is part of our team in Turkey. Uh, he heads up our carnivore project. And uh, in this case, uh, so there we, we tag uh, bears and uh, wolves uh, to look at how they move. So, we t so we're not allowed to have guns in Turkey. There's a whole lot of things that happen in Turkey. Uh, so that's not a gun. That's a medical delivery device. So uh, that, that so a female has just been trapped by a trap, a, a leg hold trap that doesn't have any spikes, just got has rubber, so it holds her leg, and we do it in a way that she doesn't get hurt. Um, but she's she's stuck, she's wrapped around a tree. So he's just darted her. And you see that little pink thing in her in her rump? That's a dart. So she's about to go to sleep. So we'll put a GPS collar on her, take a little bit of blood, check her health, and then give her a shot that will wake her up and let her go. And then we can follow her her movements around. And that helps us to, to determine what the adult ranges are, how much food they need to survive, and where we might expect to be human-wildlife uh, conflicts and, and how we might better manage those. So uh, we do that kind of stuff. And I, I had him to campus, I remember now, three years ago, and he gave a couple lectures. Those, again, are all recorded, and you guys can uh, listen to those if you're so interested. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, service, not just in uh, New Orleans and places like that, in the Cook Islands, in this case, this is a, a long-term project we do in my coastal marine management class. Uh, this is one of our students who's now a, um, and now works for US Fish and Wildlife Service in San Diego. And uh, she's doing uh, surveys to look at how sustainable our seafood supply is. In my lab in particular, I try to get you guys as involved as you want to be in stuff. So this is Jared, so this guy now works for, um, is one of our graduates. He now works for the US Army Corps of Engineers. When he came, he was a very nice guy. He's very quiet. Jerry's very nice. He's very respectful. And I am very obnoxious and loud. And so he started coming and volunteering our, in our lab. And he said, oh, yeah, so can I, can I do something? Yeah, come on, go over here. Okay, okay, um, and he started out helping out, just volunteering, which is cool. And then as he got a little more experience, 
a little more work, and then a little more work, and then a little more work, and then, hey, why don't you help us with the analysis now? Why don't you help us out with that? Okay, that's cool, got that. Hey, why don't you help us make some graphs now? Hey, why don't you help us make some posters? So in this case, he's presenting a poster from our lab, some, one of our research efforts, at the CSU Chancellor's Office in Long Beach, and then in walks the, the governor. And so he ended up, talk, he was ended up you know, explaining work to presidents of the CSU, to the, to the governor of the state of California, all that great stuff. And he, he just came so far. And now he's a really polished public speaker. Uh, he's, still, he's still a little more quiet than I am, because he's more mature than I am. But, um, but we really try to give you guys those types of experiences in ESRM. And of course you can get those in other programs and that, but I think we do a particularly good job of that kind of stuff here. So I think what, it's a good time. We do a lot of stuff with the state of California. Um, we, we don't just, uh, most of our, <coughs> many of our classes, if not all our upper division classes, have field components, if not have a, a large fraction of the time outside the classroom. So that's both in the field, but it's also in relevant industries. In this case, this is the largest seafood importer on the West Coast. Uh, Santa Monica Seafoods in, in, uh, in the greater Los Angeles area. They serve everywhere from Vegas up to Central California. And so these are our students touring their facility. Um, I, we already mentioned about uh, Louisiana and our, and our work there. Um, again, increasingly we do stuff with technology, but, but not only technology, we have, we have all kinds of projects. This is our students learn, uh, getting a tour from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute up in Monterey. Um, in my lab, sometimes you, Certain things like the robot things or the oil spill things I think get in the news, so people think that's all we do. We do a ton of stuff. A lot of basic ecology, basic environmental science stuff. And in this case, this is uh, uh, our work at Ormond Beach. So there's a bunch of students doing field work. So we do a lot of field work, although we do it year round. Most of our field work tends to be concentrated in spring and summer. So in this case, we're, we're, we're catching insects and seeing uh, how many insects are in these areas. And then we have a lot of lab time, so processing time. And so what that means is, uh, I know you get, a lot of you guys have jobs and have other commitments and stuff. Um, once you get trained up and know how to do stuff, the first you know, couple weeks we want you to be working in groups and learn how to do stuff. But once you get going, if you want to help out, you can sort of set your own hours, right? Because it's not as if we're doing a chemical reaction that has to start at 8 a.m. and then 10 a.m. you have to do this. And it's, it's, it's a lot more uh, potentially distributed time, so you can fit it around your schedule. So I think a lot of our research fits in well with with your guys' uh, uh, time commitments or, that you already have. Um, we do a lot of work with different state agencies and we get awards and stuff. Um, we also uh, involve our students in as many um, true experiences that are, will be like what they will experience when they graduate as possible. So in this case, when you guys park out in the big parking lot, our new, new, it's not new to you guys, it's new to us old people, uh, and then walk across the little bridge or drive across the bridge, that little across thing, the research, the, the restoration that was there was, was planned out by one of my restoration ecology classes. So um, really great experience and um, we could do stuff right here on campus or on, do a lot of work out on Santa Rosa Island, which you've probably heard already from Dr. O'Heirich or, or Will here. Um, okay, so before I go on, I wanna take a quick pause. You guys, are, I'm so incredibly entertaining. You guys are just uh, that, that talkative, so I, I get it. Um, so if you have questions, again, interrupt me. But what I want to say is, um, not everybody's an ESR major. <coughs> whatever your major is, what I want you guys all to do, history, soj, whatever, I want you to go bug your professors this week, and next week, and the week after. I want you to get involved with whatever your shtick is. Economics, uh, poli-sci, chemistry, whatever, get involved. That is the best thing you can do. Tons of our students get tons of jobs. It's, we're probably north of 94, 95% of our ESRM majors get jobs in ESRM. That's almost unheard of. That's very, very unusual. My, my, I came from UCSB as an undergrad and UCLA as a PhD student. Um, uh, but, a, but a small fraction of our undergrads right after they graduate are working in the, in the fields that we, we train them in typically. In my case, it was biology and ecology. Um, and I think we do a great job. One of the key reasons is we have all kinds of experience. We build experiences throughout our curriculum for you guys and we give you guys lots of opportunities to do that. But you need to take advantage of that. We aren't a massive 30,000 student school, right? We're a relatively small school still. Take advantage of that. 
So uh, go knock on doors and say, hey, you do, I don't know, political science stuff? That sounds cool. I want to do political science stuff. Can I help you? And they'll probably, like me, they'll probably be super busy. Uh, I kind of, uh, that's cool. So bug them the next week. Hey, so just checking back in again. I know you're really busy. Can you, can I, can you need any, can I do anything? Need any help with whatever? Keep bugging them. If that person eventually doesn't get back to you, try the next person and the next person and the next person. So when I was an undergrad, so here, here's, here's another old guy telling you sagely wisdom. So when I was an undergrad, I, um, I didn't want to be a scientist. I thought scientists were mostly a-holes. I thought they were dispassionate people. And I wanted to be a, um, uh, a journalist, an investigative journalist. Um, and uh, so I've taken some classes and this and that, and I, I found a cool major. And, and then my mentors dared me to take this genetics class. And uh, especially when I was younger, the way people would get me to do stuff, go, oh, that's okay, if that's too hard, you don't have to do it. Oh, I can do that, you know, I'm not afraid. And so they would trick me into taking things. So, so they said, take this class. So I took this class with a bunch of pre-meds. It was supposed to be a very hard class. And I actually did really, really, really well. I was like, well, I actually kind of like it. That's pretty cool. So I took another class. And I said, well, this is something I want to get interested in. But I, well, I didn't discover that until I was a sophomore. So I was bummed out because I thought all my other, you know, marine bio type friends, they, they all started, you know, way before me. And they're all up on it. So I started knocking on uh, professors' doors. Again, this was at UC Santa Barbara. Forty-something doors I knocked on. It, no, yeah, thanks. No, 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 no. Like, oh, man, I'll do the horrible stuff. I'll wash the skanky little glass vial. Thing. No, 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 no paint jobs. Thank you. And boom, 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 boom. So finally, I'm, this one guy answered the door. He goes, hey, we don't have any money, but you can do this horrible crap for us if you want. I said, okay, I'll do this horrible crap for you. So I started washing test tubes. Then they started taking me out. Uh, it was a lab that does what's called ecotoxicology. We'd go out in a boat out in the Santa Barbara Channel. They would put on <coughs> scuba gear and got to do cool scuba diving. I would sit on the boat in this channel and it would bounce up and down. And they would bring up these <coughs> cores from the bottom of the ocean that were full of hydrogen sulfide that smelled like rotten eggs. And I would sit there and do stuff to them with nasty smelling chemicals and basically throw up all the time. So I was like, oh my god, I'm so seasick. I'm like, worst thing ever, worst thing ever. Um, but I stuck around. And um, it wasn't a macho thing, it wasn't a dude thing, it was persistence, is what it was. And so then after a while I said, okay, maybe we'll show you how to do a little bit with the engine. And maybe we'll show you how to fix these nets. And then slowly but surely, a little bit more, a little bit, then they, then they paid for me to get scuba certified, and they paid me to get what's called research scuba certified. And then they hired me in the lab 10 hours a week. And that was huge, I had four part-time jobs to pay for school, so I totally get the, I get the thing about having to work a lot and everything. But then that allowed me to not have to do all my DJ gigs and photography gigs and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so, so th and then eventually when um, I graduated, it just so happened the guy that was in charge of my lab, he left to go to another university so that I was hired full time to run the lab. And that, that's the key thing, that's the key thing. So many of my, stu I get, you know, last week probably did like seven reference checks that people are calling our students that are getting jobs. And what everybody asks, all, uh, potential employers, what they say is, what has this person done? They do not mean what classes have this, has this person taken. They don't, I mean, in general, they want to know if it's a, if it's a science -y job. They want to know if you had a degree in biology or chemistry or whatever, you know, something vaguely related. As long as it's something vaguely related, that's OK. The next part is, what have you done? So they want to know, oh, well, I went on this research project with Dr. O'Hyrick and did this, and I went on to this thing over here, and I went to this thing. And ev almost every single time, people are shocked at how much experience our undergrads have. They think they're graduate students. And I don't say that to mean that you guys have to do all this insane research, but the opportunities are there if you guys want to take advantage of them. So the last old uh, bald dude story I'll tell you guys <laughs> is um, uh, the story I tell everybody is, um, so, so because I, I eventually double majored and my majors didn't really have anything, there was one class they shared in common, so, so it, wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't the most efficient way to go. <laughs> I thought it wasn't like ESRM or anything. Uh, so um, all my friends were graduating in four years and it took me four years and a quarter to graduate. We were on the quarter system. And so we're coming near the end of the four years and we lived in this total skanky uh, dive house in, uh, in Isla Vista. 
And um, we had a barbecue, we had a, a fire pit in back. And I was coming back, it was a Thursday afternoon, and my uh, roommates were all sitting around drinking beers, because what else can you do Thursday afternoon? And, um, and they're, they're, uh, the technical term is bitching and moaning. So they were complaining about how hard stuff was. This was the early 90s, wasn't as bad as our current recession, but before our most recent recession, that was the worst one. And it was really, really tough. And so all these, most of these guys were kind of marine bio types, sort of environmental science-y kind of types. And they said, man, there's no jobs. There's no jobs, this, this sucks. We're getting ready to graduate, and there's no jobs. And uh, you know, so I put my bike away, and I sat down, and I said, what are you guys talking about? I said, Just, we're, we're bummed, we're gonna graduate, and we don't know what we're gonna do. Um, and I said, what are you talking about? I said, what? Wow, well, we're looking around, we can't find any job. I said, what are you talking about, man? I got an offer to go to Antarctica, I got an offer to go to Hawaii, and da, 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 da. And they said, oh, dude, that's you. They said, that's just you, man, you're like super lucky. And like, you get all the cool stuff, right? And there's always luck involved with this jazz, right? Just who you bump into on the streets, and hey, there's a job. So there's always a, a bit of luck involved. But um, they were sitting around on a Thursday drinking beer, right? And they had a great time. They're good friends of mine. They, they, had a, they had a great time in college. But you know, when they had a chance to go surf, they would go surf all the time. When they had a chance to go you know, or ski or whatever, they would go to that, you know, that kind of jazz. They had a great old time. When I had some free time, I would go volunteer for other people in their labs. And again, I'm using the science example, but the analogy applies to whatever you're doing, English, history, whatever. I was getting this experience, and I got to be known as a dude that wasn't a total idiot. And so because I wasn't a total idiot, when people were looking around for um, who they could collaborate, or I need another helper, who the, I need someone competent. You know, they don't, they don't have to know what, I'll teach them what they have to know, but I want someone I can trust. Oh, get that dude. Yeah, hey, John, come over here. Go do this horrible stuff. And it's super cold morning and that kind of stuff. I'd be like, okay. So that's the difference. So that's what I want you guys to do. I want you to take advantage of the time you have here. And it's totally cool if you come and volunteer in my lab, and after a month or so, you're like, this guy's a jerk, or this stuff isn't interesting. It's all good. It's all good. Give it some time. Give it a few weeks. Give it a month or so, right? But if it's not the right fit, awesome. Totally good. Now you know I don't want to do that stuff. Move on to the next thing. It's so easy right now for you guys to do that. Once you graduate, it gets exponentially harder. Because then you guys are going to be married, or you're going to have an apartment you have to pay for, duh, 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 and it just gets harder and harder to switch what you want to do. Not impossible, but harder and harder. Right now, you can try this stuff out. Six months, don't like that, try this on. Take advantage of that. Don't waste this opportunity. We're a small school, you can work with me, a Dr. Heyrich, anybody. Um, please, 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 please don't waste that time. Ah, sounds like a dad. <laughs> sounds like a dad. Okay, so let's talk. Is there any questions about that stuff so far? Yeah. So, Professor, earlier you mentioned that you were planning on sticking a laser measuring device on the bottom of one of your drones, mm -hmm. taking it across and measure erosion levels. Have you thought about uh, there are certain radar devices, essentially, that have, um, that can actually penetrate um, through a yep. inch or two of surface, yep. um, would that allow, something like that allow you to maybe measure erosion inside? Yeah, that'd be, cool. that'd be super cool. That'd be super cool. So, so love to do that. Um, uh, the issue there would be power demands, but totally, yeah, let's try. Yeah, you should, you should come and, and start volunteering. Dr. Patch would probably be a great person that would be most interested in that. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Other questions? Are you having issues with the FAA about? Yes, yes, drugs? yes. Yes. You have to register, right? So we are, yeah, so right. So, so well, event, yes, yes and no. So, so there are weird things about being at a school versus if you privately own one versus if you're a commercial operation. So we're in this kind of weird thing. But the answer is yes. So we have um, <coughs> permissions. Our last permission is coming in a couple weeks. Um, but we also have special agreements. We're, we're in this really sweet spot for this technology. We have our model airplane club on campus. Nobody has a 25-year-old airfield, for example. Um, we have agreements, so we have partners in the Navy, for example, that we can fly on, on Department of Defense land. Um, you know, we have to get the permissions up first, but, but we're allowed to do that. We have the first, what's called a Memorandum of Understanding with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We're the first university in the nation to have such an agreement that allows us to fly in their space. They can use our drones. So pretty much anywhere there's a marine sanctuary, like Channel Islands, 
uh, Monterey, out in the South Pacific. So, um, so, and, then, and, and so our last full final things are coming, full final permissions that lets us fly essentially anywhere. Um, but right now we have agreements, we get around that by having agreements and colleagues that have those permissions. So we're, we're at the final stage of getting that stuff. But absolutely, yeah, the FAA's, um, the technical term is head up their rump. They really, really, really screwed the pooch on this whole thing and have caused the situation, in my opinion, to be much more dangerous than it is. So they delay, so we're, we're, we're becoming a regional training center for the professionalization and safe use of this technology, but they've delayed us. So we've been delayed, but the Yahoo kids smoking out, going down Potrero on a skateboard with a drone falling them, that's okay, right? But the group that's trying to do this responsibly and teach everybody how to you know, use this stuff safely, FAA's like, well, you gotta get this and that. So, so I, I really do think they've made the situation much more dangerous. The other thing, last thing to say is, um, the FAA doesn't have, uh, this, is a, this, is, this is a contentious thing, but they actually don't have the right to not let you fly. So we're, we're trying to follow the rules and all this and that. They basically put a thing up on their website and say, hey, we control this, so you can't do that. So the people that have been fined have gotten permission from the FAA, and then the FAA says they've deviated from their permission. So a lot of those folks, if they didn't have those permissions, they wouldn't be doing something illegal. So I'm not, I'm not encouraging people to do unsafe things, but, but the whole FAA thing is so through the looking glass, it is beyond crazy. Um, but yeah, so we, we deal with them a lot. Uh, undergrad, uh, so, uh, uh, diff in different ways. So a lot of stuff from the Cook Islands, we haven't processed. So we've just done the first initial cull. So, um, so that is a real, real issue, which is that we're, we've, we're getting to the point now with internet stuff, with these robot things, that we can get so much data, just not even analyzing, just managing the data in and of itself is a huge deal. Um, so, uh, there are programs, like that program we use to make the 3D model that really help us with that, um, but it's an ongoing challenge. So we, we, at this point, we pretty much do subsets of the data, and we do summary statistics of the data. But for example, we, we have an infrared camera that we're getting ready to start to count wildlife, uh, so to census coyote and, and deer and things like that. When we're looking for stuff, we can count the deer and all this stuff, but there's all kinds of other data, right? All kinds of other cool stuff, maybe mice, maybe plant, and we just sort of save that, but we don't analyze it. So, so there's tons of room for projects for students if you guys want like, hey, you, know, you guys did that, but there's all this other cool stuff. So yeah, it's a challenge, it's a challenge. Somebody else had a question? Yeah. What time is your classes on Fridays? The drone class, the lecture part goes 10 to noon, and then the afternoon is sort of open hours for if you guys, however long you guys want get practice walking. It's more of a, it's an interdisciplinary class, but it's also about teaching guys how to do stuff, and it's like riding a bike. Some people jump on the bike and like, what up dude, no hands. Other people like fall down for, you know, 14 weeks and then finally learn it. So it's two hours, 10 to noon, and then open time. So yeah, the only, the only defined time every single week is 10 to noon. So yeah, if you guys are interested, come by. Okay, other questions? How am I, am I almost out of time? Yeah. How many units did you return I think it's four. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's four because of the way we had to work it, but um, uh, yeah, it's cool. You guys talk to me, uh, other questions? You guys talk to me after too. Okay, I'm gonna run through, I've been talking for so long, we're almost out of time, right? 10 minutes or something? So I'm gonna run through a quick example, so really quick through this example, okay? So this is why I think um, ES, the way we train you guys to think in ESRM is incredibly valuable and, and, and needed. So in this case, this is a story about what happened with the Deepwater Horizon, the big oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, let's see if you guys can see that, hear this. This is uh, in, the mid, in the midst of the oil spill, this was happening. This is Conan O'Brien on this show. Oh, geez, that was really high tech. Okay, Baha, very funny. That was actually totally wrong. That was not what happened. That misimpression was what I thought was happening. That misimpression governed the, what the general public thought. It governed what the regulators thought, what everybody thought. 
what actually happened was most of the oil was down in the water column. So once this oil started flowing out, this, this, this is a, a 1.5 kilometers down until you get to the bottom of the ocean, and then we drilled a couple miles down. This, was, this is literally going to the moon, not even going to the moon, it's going to Mars technology. Amazing technical ability to, to do this drilling and, and get all this kind of stuff. Once, once that oil was, once the, the <coughs> pipe essentially broke, we were screwed. We had no great solution. And so what we saw is a series of trade-offs. The best thing to do is at the top of my list. Just cap that sucker, stop the oil flowing. If we couldn't do that, then the next best thing is the next thing down, capture the oil. If we couldn't capture the oil, the next best thing to do is to, to turn it into something less bad, to transform it into something else. And then the last option would be just to give up, which nobody wanted to do. As we go down the list, the trade-offs get more and more problematic and there's more and more bad things that happen. Um, uh, when the oil spill happened, we threw everything out at, up against the wall and tried to do whatever we could to stop it. Um, don't have time for this. Uh, we're almost up, so I'll just skip ahead a little bit. So um, the first signal that something really, really weird was going on was this. This is, uh, so I, I chaired a national working group looking at what was going on with the oil spill. And this is one of my partners, uh, Mandy Joy, Samantha Joy from the University of Georgia. She goes down with, with ships and robots and takes plugs at the bottom of the ocean and gets sediment. And she looks at the critters that are in there. Every single core at the bottom of the ocean, she always found something macroscopic, something alive you can see with your eye, maybe a snail, maybe a worm, something. And so when you get on the left, the left image over there is a piece of the bottom of the ocean from a site far away, which is like all the other sites, basically on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, off of Louisiana. The one in the middle, there's starting to be some gunk. Can you guys see that? There's like some sort of like oily snot kind of thing. It's a technical term. Uh, up on top there. And then we start to get closer to the, the break. We start to see inches thick of this oily gunk, flocculent oily stuff. In this heavily oiled thing, there is, n I mean, there's, there's bacteria, there's, there's always microbial stuff, but there is nothing macroscopic alive in there. All the worms are dead, all the, everything's dead. Nobody had ever seen that. And that was the first real clue that something really weird was going on. So this was the problem. We were using an incorrect mental model. We were not taking a first principles approach. We were not taking an interdisciplinary approach that's thinking about the problem. So this is, what, this is the model that I had in my mind that everybody that studied oil spills had in their mind. We were used to shallow water oil spills. A tanker cracks open, a pipeline breaks, and it's, it's either at the surface or very close to the surface. And that's what happens. There's a little bit of oil kind of goes on the bottom maybe, but most of it floats up. The stuff that's light turns into you know, um, gases and, and basically floats away in the air. The rest of the oil clumps on the surface, and then when the wind blows towards, it, towards the land, it goes on and it fouls the beaches and the wetlands. And I do a lot of work in wetlands. So people like me were the problem. I was the problem. I was saying, the wetlands, the wetlands, save the wetlands. And so everybody's worried about the wetlands. Uh, and so what we did in this spill is we took this old, this existing model and we just shifted it. We said, hey, the same stuff's going to happen when it's down, you know, way, way, way deeper in the bottom of the ocean. That's not what actually happened. This is what actually happened. We created a plume. And so this was an oil spill. This was mostly a <coughs> methane spill. You can't see methane, so people don't think about that. But the vast amount of the hydrocarbons that were released were, were methane gas, natural gas. And so what we found happening... Oh, the other thing we get was we get all these politicians, super smart people, uh, and they would say stuff like, we're not stupid. We know what happens when you mix oil and water, water floats. Actually, it doesn't. So if we had time, I'd show you this other video. At this depth and this pressure, oil is negative. Oil does not float. The only reason oil shot off of the, or came off the bottom of the ocean was because it was coming out of a fire hose. And it was squirting up. And so the, the turbulence and the warmth and the squishing and the jija, that pushed it up. Once we got to so the bottom of the, so the well break was at about 1,500 meters. Once it got to between 1,400 meters and 1,200 meters, it was still really deep, the oil and the methane sort of separated. And we had this dispersed flocculent crud. 
and it formed this layer of this crud. The other problem is a lot of these politicians don't believe in evolution, so that's awesome. So we actually had seven different uh, distinct waves of, of different types of microbial life happen over the 84 days of this spill. So you can think of it as, as seven different, at least seven different species came and went. These things were called methanogens. These things eat methane. Normally they're super crazy good. They're good scavengers because there, there isn't a lot of, if we poured some methane right here, it would go away super quick. So normally in the natural environment, methane, meth methanogens are really great. They're scavenging. They look at, oh my God, it will eat that. Here there was so much methane that went in the northern Gulf of Mexico. This was something like, we calculated 10% of the global um, of, of, the, of the annual net primary productivity, which doesn't sound like a lot, it's a crap load of carbon. So all of a sudden, it went from being a guy that's, oh my god, I'm totally starving, let me find something to eat, to your crazy uncle sitting on his couch, smoking out, eating Doritos, and having bags and bags of Doritos. After a while, you start throwing the Doritos, and the Doritos are going on his face, going on his belly, going on the ground. He doesn't care, he's got tons of bags of Doritos. And he's like, Doritos, Doritos, Doritos. And he's becoming lazy. So every, ge every generation, they became less selective methanogen eaters. So by the time you get ready to cap this sucker, right, 84 days, it's like your uncle. And he's like, I love Doritos. And then, all of a sudden, overnight, we take away the Doritos. We cap the well. Now all these microbes are like, where, where, there's the Doritos? Right, where's the Doritos? And they start freaking out, right, having withdrawals. And so when microbes do that, they freak out. And one of the things they do is they release some of the material that's inside their cells, and they create this sort of uh, mucilage type stuff. So that, that jazz is now mixing with all this dispersed oil. That oil is starting to clump, 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 clump. And all of a sudden you get oil. Now, remember I told you it's denser than water at that depth. And then it sticks together, gets a little denser, and it sinks. So we saw this huge impact at the bottom of the ocean and in the midwater column. The president does not go into the ocean. CNN does not go into the bottom of the ocean. So this is not what people saw. Instead, people said, oh, we're so smart. We totally <coughs> squirted all this detergent in the ocean. And oh, we're so smart. We saved the wetlands. It, was, it completely missed the story as to what was going on. So I'll, I'll say this, and I'll end, and I'll let you guys go. So this is what actually happened. So this is um, a couple areas. Littoral fringe is the area along the coast. The, the benthos is the bottom of the ocean. The blue is water column. So there's just a couple, this is a, this is a, a diff different, different places. So less than 50 centimeters at the very skin of the ocean. As you go down deeper and deeper, same thing. So I'm going to show you guys what's called a radar diagram. It's a chart, but it only has one axis. The only measurement is away from the center. So that's that. So it's also called a spider diagram. So this, is, knowing what we know, this is what we all thought was going to happen. So here, the, 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 this represents the farther away from the center, the more things are hurt by this oil spill. The more whales, the more clams, whatever, right? And so, um, is that me? Oh, my timer's done. I should have shut up for you guys, I guess. Um, so this is what we thought was going on. This is what actually happened now, we believe. So yes, there was some impact on some of the wetlands a little bit and, and, and this and that, but really the big story was down in the middle of the water column and down deep. This is what your government did. So I, same figure, now I'm just gonna shift the axes a little so I can show something. So same exact data, just, just a little bit different. Now this is, and the National Science Foundation needs to be congratulated. They were the first entity that gave money for scientists to go out and start to measure what was going on. So we went out. And if you look at all the studies they funded, that's what we've graphed here. Uh, this is where they spent money. A ton of people went out in the wetland and said, oh my god, we got to study the wetland. No oil, or very little oil went to the wetlands. But yet that's where we spent most of our money. So the next iteration is a thing called NERDA, which you guys don't, you don't have time to go into, but another measurement. They were better. They still spent a lot of money in the marsh, but they were starting to shift to a different focus. I would argue we're out of time, but I would argue if we had a better um, uh, interdisciplinary and first principles approach, we wouldn't have um, started with that incorrect thing. The problem is the Gulf of Mexico, they don't like things like those environmental rules, right? So it's, it's hard for me to emphasize how important this is. 
if we weren't out there measuring it, we didn't prove it. So I can say, which absolutely happened, we slaughtered hundreds of thousands of jellyfish, for example. So what the oil and gas industry says, oh, we slaughtered a bunch of jellyfish? Yeah, okay. Can you show me the data? Like, what's that? Can you show me the data that we killed a bunch? Can you show me how many jellyfish we had before and how many we have now? Oh, no, I can show you how many we have now. Oh, you, don't, you didn't measure it before? Mm, sorry, I think you're high. Right. <laughs> and it's a real issue, right? Because in a court of law, that doesn't hold up. So the fact that we weren't properly monitoring before the impact is a problem. And uh, industry is not evil. Oil companies are not necessarily evil. Uh, but they absolutely understand this kind of stuff, right? They know how the game is played. So um, we don't demonize people in ESRM, but we try to make sure that we can look at things realistically and objectively. So anyway, so I, I could talk for hours, but I won't. I'll be quiet. Thanks, you guys. I'll hang out for a bit if you guys want to have questions. Consider coming to our seminar and consider coming to our uh, drone class on Fridays at 10 in Sierra Hall. Thanks, you guys. That's my contact info. If you, uh, Dr. O'Hyrick has my contact and, info. And I'll